Chris Cole and the volatility end game. I'm going to reveal some insights right now that are going to completely blow your mind. So in case you're wondering, it's definitely time to sit down, buckle up, and pour yourself that stiff drink. We're really going to get into it today. We're going to start off by explaining this in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, fiat currency value equals belief. Let's think this through. This is going to be the key point of the entire video. What gives fiat currency value? There's only one thing. Collectively, as a group, we believe that it has value. To explore this concept further, let's go right to a clip from a recent interview with three of my favorites, Chris Cole, Grant Williams, and Bill Fleckenstein. How do you define capitalism? What is the medium of capitalism? And that's fiat money. And of course, this gets to this idea, does, does money even exist? And it doesn't exist if it's not tied to gold, it's purely a thought abstraction. So it's only worth something because we collectively believe it is. And that's kind of interesting. We, we are dependent on thought abstractions. Uh, so in this sense, when we look at what, what thought abstractions, uh, nation state exists because we believe in it. Um, money exists because we believe in it. Political parties exist because we believe in it. Reality becomes, these thought abstractions become reality. So like Chris Cole points out, if the only thing that gives fiat currency value is the fact we believe it has value, the fiat currency in and of itself is simply a thought abstraction. And our whole economy could be built around this thought abstraction that we know can deteriorate very, very quickly. Let's throw up a chart of past hyperinflations. These are great examples when the group of individuals using the currency lost belief the currency had value. It always goes back to that famous quote from Voltaire, all fiat currency eventually goes to its intrinsic value, and that is zero. But how does this directly apply to the United States? To illustrate that, we're going to start with this beautiful drawing of the United States and our economy. <laughs> it starts right in the middle with Farmer Frank. He has a plot of land and he grows corn. He supplies so much corn, it goes to all the individuals, the average Joe and Janes in the economy. The way they make money is by trading goods and services back and forth to one another. So this individual imports cell phones and he sells them to this person and this person imports clothing, shirts, and sells them to this person. This person imports, let's say, model trucks and sells them to this individual. They just kind of go back and forth. But notice, the only thing that's being produced in the United States is corn. You may be asking yourself, okay, George, where are they getting the cell phones, shirts, and model trucks? They're importing them from not the average Joe. Oh, no. The average Joe's Chinese cousin. <laughs> he is named China Cho. So China Cho makes all of the stuff in his country. We'll call it XYZ. <laughs> he makes the cell phones, the shirts, and the model trucks and exports them into the United States. And what he accepts in return are the thought abstractions, the fiat currency. Why? Because China Cho has the same belief that these currency units actually have value. If none of these four or five individuals believed the green pieces of paper have value, the green pieces of paper would not have value. So you may be saying to yourself, okay, yeah, George, I get it. 
but that's pretty much every country that uses fiat currency. Not necessarily. Because the United States is so dependent upon imports, we don't produce much of anything in the United States. We sell goods here, of course, at Target, Home Depot, Walmart, but those are all goods that are produced overseas. So in other words, we consume far more than we produce. And you can see that in the annual trade deficits year after year after year, which by the way, are growing substantially. So my point is the United States economy is completely built on a thought abstraction. And you can see this, if we just imagine this very simple economy without any dollars. If there were no dollars, if there were no fiat currency units floating around that China Cho would be willing to accept, we wouldn't have the cell phones, the shirts, and the model trucks. The only thing we would have would be the corn. What would happen to the standard of living of all the individuals if the goods and services went away and all we were left with was this one plot of land that produced corn? Obviously, the standard of living would plummet, so would economic output. And again, let's contrast that to a different type of economy that had more manufacturing, that actually produced a lot of the goods it consumed. Well, imagine that this person grows cows, this person grows cotton, this person grows wheat, and Farmer Frank is still producing corn. If we eliminate fiat currency or the dollar from that equation, would it really be a big deal? No. The only thing fiat currency would be doing would be making the transactions more convenient. Where in the first example, the fiat currency, the thought abstraction, the simple belief that the green pieces of paper have value is producing economic output all by itself. So the first concept to understand for step one is our entire economy is dependent upon a thought abstraction. The second concept to really think through, and we're gonna connect the dots in step number three, is volatility cannot be destroyed. It can only be transferred. And to understand this better, let's go right back to the interview with Grant Williams, Chris Cole, and Bill Fleckenstein. You know, volatility, you cannot destroy volatility. You can't Just destroy exactly risk. Right. Yeah. You can only transmute it in, in yeah. form and time. And so what they've done is they've distributed, you know, one standard deviation risks into tail risks. And they've brought that out to the world, uh, pretending like they're destroying risk and they're doing anything but. They're just redistributing it in different, in different ways, taking risks that we can't even fathom right now. The way I like to imagine this is it's a lot like jamming water into a hose. Pretend we've got a fire hydrant right here, and this is my very straight hose, <laughs> as you can see. So you crank on the water, the water flows through and shoots out the other side. Pretend the water, in this case, is volatility. If we cap the end of the hose, trying to suppress the volatility, the volatility of the water doesn't go away. It builds up more and more pressure until at a certain point, the volatility is released. It's just released somewhere else. So the fire hose turns on, the volatility comes out the other end, but we cap the fire hose to suppress the volatility the water still shoots through, it gets recirculated, building up more and more pressure and comes shooting out the top of the fire hydrant. So the water hasn't gone away, the pressure hasn't gone away, it's just been released in a different location. Whoa, time out. And I know right about now, our MMT troll guy came in and said, George, you're crazy. What gives the dollar value is the fact the government requires us to pay our taxes in those dollars. Well, boy, that is a brilliant observation, but I would say that so does Venezuela, so did Weimar Germany, so did Zimbabwe. There's nothing unique about the fact that a government requires its citizens to pay their taxes 
in the local currency. And there's also an argument that there's so much dollar denominated debt that that in and of itself creates demand for those dollars. And this is true, but only to a certain extent. Again, in Germany, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, did they not have debt denominated in the local currency? Of course they did, but you get to a tipping point where so much currency is created, regardless of how much is required for taxes or to pay down the debt, you have this tidal wave of money printing that completely overwhelms every other factor. More on that in step number three. Step number two, the central planners double down on building the entire economy on a thought abstraction and a belief that the medium of exchange in and of itself has value. This step starts with Farmer Frank again in his lot of land where he is growing corn and he's selling corn to individuals in the real economy. The economy is doing okay, so everyone is happy. We'll say the price of Farmer Frank's land right now is $10,000, but the economy itself is very unstable. I see it like this inverted triangle that's trying to balance on this little piece of paper and the little piece of paper can be gone at any moment. As soon as that belief is gone, the entire economy comes crashing down. But for the time being, we'll say that it's holding up. So Farmer Frank is cash flow positive. He's bringing in $1,000 worth of revenue and his expenses are only $900. So he has $100 worth of profit. But we have a recession, a depression maybe. And Farmer Frank can't sell as much of his corn. Now he's only selling one piece of corn because none of these people have money. They're all unemployed. So now his revenue is only $500. His expenses are relatively fixed. So they're at $800. He's losing $300. So the price of his property goes from $10,000 down to $5,000. Farmer Frank is in big, big trouble. But along comes the Federal Reserve and the central planners, and they say, hey, what we'll do is just print up all of this funny money in an effort to raise asset prices or the asset markets in general. So that's stocks, bonds, and housing. What we'll do is increase asset prices. People will have more wealth will create value out of the medium of exchange. And then people will spend those currency units into the economy and that will fix the insolvency problem or the cash flow problem we had originally. To dive into this deeper, let's go right back to the podcast episode with Chris Cole. Can the medium by itself create value? Or does value exist independent of the medium? Um, so the idea, and there's two schools of thought here. One is the school of thought that as someone who has a CFA designation, I grew up believing in, which is that value is independent of the medium and intrinsic to the asset. That's you know Warren Buffett, that's Seth Klarman. That's this idea that the bid and ask don't represent value any more than a Magritte pipe represents a real pipe or a painting or pipe represents a pipe. Um, prices might fluctuate, but those prices are independent of, independent of the intrinsic worth. Well, now there's this second realm of thought, which says value is generated from the medium. And in this sense, liquidity is the sole determinant of value defined by that constant bid and ask price. And as long as constant liquidity is supplied with a narrative, value is created. And that's true whether the tulpa is corporate debt, whether the tulpa is the success of Elon Musk, whether the tulpa is a factor premium in the market, uh, 
It doesn't matter as long as liquidity is flowing and there's a belief in wherever that liquidity flows, that alone creates value. And what we saw in March of 2000, this year, this is a solvency crisis. It's a continuation of the solvency crisis that started in 08. And what they, we saw correlation breakdowns. We saw basis trades blowing out. We saw all of these major problems. But I think what's really interesting is that inst- they can't deal with the solvency issue. Right. So what global policymakers did is they printed $20 trillion to try to create value out of the medium to fool people into solving a credit and solvency problem with excess liquidity. So how this works is the Fed creates funny money out of nowhere, bank reserves. And those bank reserves expand the balance sheet capacity of the primary dealer banks. This flows into the hedge funds, the financial institution. It makes asset prices rise by lowering interest rates in the real economy. So stock prices go up, bond prices go up, and housing prices go up. The Fed and the central planners are doubling down on the thought abstraction and building the entire economy around this thought abstraction. So we go from having a little bit of instability to a massive amount of instability. But the average Joe doesn't see this. Farmer Fred doesn't understand what's happening to the economy. They don't see the tsunami that's forming underneath the surface of the water. Here we've got 401k Ken, and he is super stoked because the prices of the assets in his 401k have gone up and up and up. So he thinks he's getting a lot richer. So he spends his money into the economy. That gives more cash to this guy and to this guy so they have the cash in their back pocket to go over to Farmer Fred and continue to buy the same amount of corn they were buying up here. Because of all the funny money creation, they have temporarily fixed, or tried to fix, an insolvency problem with liquidity. This is what Chris Cole was referring to, in my opinion. Don't want to put words in his mouth. But one thing he said explicitly is this creation of funny money, in a way, has created value in and of itself because the price of Farmer Fred's property has gone from $10,000 up to $20,000. But you have to ask yourself the question, has value been created? Has the cash flow insolvency problem been solved or has it gotten even worse? Farmer Fred's property doesn't produce any more corn. The ability for these individuals in the real economy to buy the corn from Farmer Fred didn't come as a result of their labor or additional production that they created. It only came as a result of the Fed creating more electronic units of measurement on their balance sheet, also known as bank reserves, and all of this financial engineering that we have to try to get asset prices to continually go up and up and up, regardless of what's going on with the underlying fundamentals. And Chris Cole said it beautifully, fundamentals are dead, meaning it doesn't matter how much corn Farmer Fred can produce anymore. The only thing that matters is how much liquidity is being pumped into the system. The more liquidity that's pumped into the system, the bigger this triangle gets. And you have to remember this triangle is built on a thought abstraction alone. The only thing our entire economy is built on is the belief that the medium of exchange in and of itself actually has value. This is what the central planners are doubling down on every single time they come up with more quantitative easing or more stimulus. It's just like the old elephant in the circus that they train to balance on a couple of bottles. 
Only in that case, at least the bottles were something tangible. What we're doing is we're training our elephant or the economy <laughs> to balance on something that isn't even real. Step number three, civil war or hyperinflation. Now it is officially stiff drink time. That is for sure. Sit down and buckle up. Let's get right into it. And I know a lot of you, or a lot of the friends and family member Fred are saying, oh, George, you're just exaggerating. You're fear mongering. There's never going to be a civil war, or any type of serious amount of inflation in the United States. We have the world reserve currency. Okay, fine. Just give me a moment and wait till after step number three and then come to your own conclusions as to what you think the probabilities are. We've gone from a Fed put to a government put. What I mean by that, back in 2008, the Fed came in with quantitative easing, money printing, whatever you want to call it. And even if it was just a psychological effect, it increased asset prices. When they're buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities from the primary dealers and the banks under the Fed's umbrella, they're increasing the balance sheet capacity of those banks to create additional loans for the hedge funds, financial institutions. And there was a lot of private money flowing into the markets as well. So the bottom line is with this Fed put, the treasuries or assets are going onto the Fed's balance sheet. They're creating more and more bank reserves. That's giving balance sheet capacity to the banking system. The hedge funds, the financial institutions lever up. The average Joe sees that piles into the market with his Robinhood account and assets go up and up and up. Stocks, bonds, and real estate, as we said before. But very little of the inflation leaks out into the real economy. We have asset inflation, but we don't necessarily have consumer price inflation to the same extent. I would argue the CPI is definitely understated, but we didn't get hyperinflation from the Fed taking their balance sheet from 800 billion prior to the GFC to over 4.5 trillion in 2000, call it 18, and now in 2020, up to over $7 trillion. And you may say to yourself, okay, George, well, fine, it's worked so far. I saw what you're talking about in step number two. Why don't we just keep doing this? Because we've got to take these scenarios to their logical outcome. As asset prices increase, so does social unrest, because not every person owns assets. If you're part of the unfortunate few that doesn't own assets, the likelihood you ever will decreases the higher the asset prices go up. In other words, you lose hope. And if a human being loses hope, they take extreme measures. Let's go back to step number one momentarily and think through this from a standpoint of volatility. Remember, Chris Cole tells us that volatility can't be destroyed. It can only be transferred. So if the Fed, through quantitative easing or funny money, whatever it is, if they're reducing what is naturally volatile, stock markets go up, and believe it or not, they go down. <laughs> At least they should. So if you try to eliminate that volatility and smooth it out, where the only thing that asset prices do is just gradually go up and up and up. In this controlled environment, the volatility has to come out somewhere. So where is it going to come out? Through social unrest. Prior to this financial engineering, we had social unrest, but it was relatively stable. What we've seen is the more the central planners try to micromanage everything and eliminate that volatility from asset prices, the social unrest goes up and up and up and gets more and more volatile. There's an inverse relationship between the two. So going back to step number two, the more the Fed tries to fix a solvency problem with more liquidity, or the more they try to create value from the medium of exchange, the more social unrest we are going to have and the closer we're going to come 
to a civil war. And it's not just me saying this. It's not that Austrian crazy guy, George, on YouTube. It's also the pros. Pros just like Chris Cole. Editor, let's go right to the clip. I do know one thing, though. If they keep doing what they're doing, which is just trying to inject liquidity to solve this solvency problem, further exacerbating the income disparity. We run this 10 standard deviation, 20 standard deviation risk of a breakdown in democracy. Yeah. And I told that to the New York Times back in 2017. Said, I, you know, I'm not scared of the left tail. I'm not really scared of the right tail. I, I am scared that they, they take this experiment and keep going and they create a tail risk that, that you cannot hedge, which is complete civil unrest. Yeah. And yeah. we are now beginning to see that. We are now beginning to see that. Um, and uh, that's, that's your real risk uh, of the political risk. Um, and that's also how it can end. You know, you can, you can have a war or you can have a, you can have a social revolution. But remember, we've gone from trying to prop up the economy with a Fed put to now a government put. The objective is the same. Create more liquidity to prop up asset prices or to paper over all the fundamental problems, the structural issues with the actual economy. But the transfer mechanism is a lot different. Over here, the liquidity, as we've seen, generally stays within the financial economy. But when the government tries to come in and create liquidity through UBI, stimulus checks, infrastructure spending, the Fed has to monetize the debt, meaning the Fed has to buy all those treasuries your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam is issuing in order to spend all the funny money into the real economy or create more bank reserves, more currency units, chasing the same amount of goods and services. And it goes back to what we were talking about in step number one, that all of this is predicated upon the belief, our collective belief, there's value in the medium of exchange, that those green pieces of paper actually have value themselves. But if we think about value going back to our simple economy where Farmer Fred is producing corn and the individuals are using that corn to put food on the table, just because there's additional currency units floating around doesn't mean that there's more wealth that's created. It doesn't mean there's more consumption. It doesn't mean there's more value. And sooner or later, it's just like Wile E. Coyote running right off the cliff where he stays suspended in air until finally he looks down realizes there's nothing there, and he falls all the way down. <laughs> I've seen it a million times in those cartoons, and it's the exact same. At some point in time, society realizes the emperor has no clothes. And we can think about it this way, just a simple chart. As money printing increases, the amount of currency units chasing the same amount of goods and services goes up and up and up at a certain point to prop up the entire economy. If the economy revolves around this belief system that the currency has value, you've got to create more and more currency units. It becomes exponential. But as the curve becomes exponential, the belief that the currency itself has value the thought abstraction starts to deteriorate faster and faster and faster. This too becomes exponential, but instead of going up, it's going down. This is where we get into a hyperinflation type of scenario. When we go from an abstraction being reality to reality, actually being reality, is when the US dollar, the US economy, the whole house of cards, comes crashing down. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I want to be very clear, I am not here saying that the United States is going to go into a civil war or we're going to have hyperinflation. What I am saying 
is if we continue on this path of trying to build our entire economy on a belief system, something that isn't real, something that doesn't exist, sooner or later, the outcome has to be civil war or hyperinflation. We know the chances the central planners continue down this path is above zero. What's the probability exactly? I'm not smart enough to know. I'll let you be the judge. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I will see you on the next video.